Hey everyone, my name is Ben Chaish, and today we are taking a look at combining a medium format 44 by 33 millimeter sensor with a 50 millimeter f0.95 lens for a insane, ridiculous look. have the Hasselblad 907X, which I will be doing a full review on soon, as well as the GFX 50S. Now a big part of obviously the appeal of a medium format sensor is having a larger megapixel count, having bigger pixels, having more resolution in that medium format look. And while 50 megapixels is actually a really great resolution, you know, a lot of the higher end cameras like the Canon R5 and the Sony's, the R series from them, like the A7 R4 and even the A1 and um, a lot of those other cameras are already pushing that, you know, 50 megapixel plus. So it's not just megapixels that does it for most people. And now the newest iteration of this GFX camera does 100 megapixels. So, I mean, there is just a ton of resolution out there. Personally, as a wedding photographer, I don't really care about anything over 50 megapixels. Pretty much anything in that about 20 to 50 range is just like kosh and great for me. But the thing that is most unique uh, visually about a lot of the images outside of the extra dynamic range and uh, just that detail you get out of a medium format sensor is often that more shallow depth of field that you're getting by having that shallow depth of field lens and then combining it with a larger sensor than an APS-C or a full frame 35 millimeter-ish sensor. And so when you combine this F0.95 lens with a larger sensor of about a 0.72 magnification, which is about the you know difference in if you grab a 35 millimeter sensor or lens and then times it by 0.72, that's gonna give you about the equivalent lens uh, conversion. And then also you are basically getting one stop more of equivalent look of light. Um, so the depth of field in here is anywhere between 0.62 or something like that and 0.75, which again, 0.95 is already incredibly shallow, but then you're adding it to a larger sensor, giving an apparent or yeah, an apparently shallower depth of field, uh, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Now I've tested this lens out on both the 907X and the GFX 50S. Both of them actually share the same sensor, but overall adapting a Leica M mount lens, which I have on both of these right now, to these cameras makes a pretty cool little setup and a look you pretty much can't get otherwise. So this is the TT Artisan 50 0.95. It's not the $12,000 or whatever Noctilux from Leica. And what you'll definitely get out of this is Great build quality. I will do a separate review on this lens in particular um, because it obviously warrants that. I think this lens is, yeah, definitely sub a thousand dollars, and you're getting a full frame 50 millimeter f0.95, which on its own end is fantastic. But then adding it to this sensor really kind of just brings it to the next level. And the point of this though is if you're going to be taking photos at f0.95, you're not exactly expecting them or looking for some sort of ultimate sharpness or landscape quality images. It's definitely not gonna be something that you're gonna be, you know, pixel peeping and checking out all of the sharpness in people's eyes or whatever the case may be. This is like an environmental portrait kind of situation. Um, and we'll see in some of these examples where this lens kind of shines and where it kind of just looks awful. Um, so definitely a very niche lens within a very kind of like closed system. So it only kind of works and is magic in a few situations. But overall on both cameras, this lens is definitely super heavy on the Leica M system um, and is just kind of ridiculous. But as you can see on this GFX, it's actually balanced really, really well. This thing, the, the 50S at least has a really great grip. 
Um, and so carrying this around just feels sort of like a native lens would. There's kind of no big issues there. It felt really, really well balanced, all that kind of stuff. And then actually, while you add it to the 907X as well, if you saw my other video where I kind of introduced that combo, you would have also seen that, you know, it's actually not that bad of a setup. You know, it's definitely pretty front heavy and kind of wacky in that way, but overall, this is still a really, really minor, small combination. Um, and if you're used to using a Hasselblad in any way, this isn't going to be something that's just absolutely ridiculous. And using the native XCD lenses for this actually, you know, felt longer and more top heavy and all sorts of stuff as well. So if you're thinking about the size of it, once you're pairing it with, you know, one of these medium format sensors, you're actually not going to be having much of an issue. Obviously, <laughs> this doesn't pass my uh, balance test by any means, but you know, you're getting it. It's such a small, small, small package that I would not be necessarily worried about the weight and the size of this in that. All right, so let's check out some images. I have used these both for personal work and stuff just around the house and uh, with my family and stuff. It's definitely where I get a lot of the kind of practice in with this kind of stuff, so I'm not just going in blind to an actual paid gig or wedding. So I did a bunch of that, and then I also went and took both of these cameras to wedding. I used all of the Hasselblad on the actual XCD lenses, but then used the 50 millimeter f0.95 on the GFX. I was able to get a lot of really, really good stuff there. So let's check out the images and see how it performs and what kind of issues we're running into and what the overall look actually is. So obviously a good old mirror self-portrait here. Um, one of the things that I did first off was just typed in Voigtlander because knowing that I've used those profiles before, I know that it shows some crazy wide lens, um, which takes away a lot of the vignetting. And then once you kind of add you know, a little bit more here or there. That's definitely helped out the look. You can either do it there or here, but it's pretty easy actually to get rid of all of that vignetting. Here is just a photo of my son. It's one of the first photos that I took with that, but you can see how just incredibly shallow this is. I mean, it's just like, you know, very, 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 very shallow. And you can see like, you know, at 100% here, his hair is not exactly in focus. Nothing's really super well in focus. Uh, maybe his like upper lip here or his cheek. Uh, but again, you're not going for ultimate sharpness. You're going for the look that this lens provides, which in this case um, is fairly significantly interesting. Uh, one of the things you'll start to notice, this is corrected and edited, but you're seeing this line right here start to kind of ramp up. The biggest issue, and we'll I'm sure hit it soon, is that it has kind of like what has been described to me as like a mustache distortion. So it's pretty even here, you know, it kind of bows, but then it really kind of accentuates whatever the issues are about here in the corners. So not the best but here is like an example where you know this this setup works great you can see a little bit of the weird distortion up here but overall in terms of the look of the actual image um you know it looks really great you have some really good bokeh right here the subject separation is like ridiculous you see a little bit of this kind of smearing and whatever you want to call it down here and like it kind of pulling out with the distortion there as well but, you know, it's kind of like something that I think you're gonna kind of overlook for the most part. And as we move on, one of the things, this is like one of the most like trippy images to me. So you can see, you know, they're, they're getting their shoes on and whatever, but you can almost start to see that it's like almost tilt shifting slightly in those corners where that smearing is occurring. And so you're getting this, you know, solid focus here in the middle and then boom, all of a sudden in this corner, you almost have something in focus back there, even though clearly at that same depth range, um, you're nowhere near being in focus. So definitely like a big kind of issue there um, if you have stuff going on in those general areas. 
So here is a what I feel like is a pretty good example of something that has a little bit more of that background depth. Uh, obviously, up here in the corners, you're getting weird bokeh and stuff. Um, you start to see that kind of swirl effect happening a little bit. But for me, that looks kind of, you know, vintage and almost like a four by five style. So I don't really mind it. And I think it really kind of makes this image pop and look really unique. Um, it might not be something I just can't hang my hat on and use all day long. Uh, but in this case, sure, it's smearing and being kind of weird in those corners. But from an image standpoint overall, like, I don't know, I kind of think it looks kind of cool. Um, but you definitely start to see, you know, a lot of hazy kind of issues and stuff like that going out towards the edges. Um, but what's kind of interesting about all that is if you just think of an actual, you know, 36 by 24 millimeter frame of a regular full frame sensor, it kind of gives you a good idea of what uh, this image performance would be on just like a regular full frame sensor, which I feel like is pretty impressive. So here's like a good example, just of like a medium close portrait. You're getting that kind of weird blur in the corners, but the look of all this kind of stuff in the depth and everything like that feels a lot more like kind of a medium format, even like maybe a six by seven style photo, almost like a Pentax or something. Uh, even though obviously the focal length isn't at that 104 or 105 2.4 range. Um, but you can start to see even in a photo like this next one, really, really fascinating what is happening. And this is probably the best example I have of just this whole process kind of looking ridiculous. So you can see that they just really pop out of this scene. But as you go to the sides, you can kind of start to see the focus shift um, back from the center into the sides. And so out here on the edges, obviously it's not in focus by any means, but these very, very close edges, you can definitely see almost have like a focus shift, like a tilt shift that starts to bring and render that kind of stuff into focus a little bit more. Um, you can see it kind of back into here and whatnot. And then obviously this front foreground area is just like kind of hot garbage and terrible looking. Um, but as an image overall, it has that like vintage filmic kind of feel. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that this is like, it, it's a it's an area where this looks cool, but you, have to kind of be okay with the fact that it almost looks like a weird tilt shifty kind of look. Here's another example. And then you can also see that kind of distortion as well. You start to look up here and you can definitely see, you know, the tree again, not actually in focus, but much more in focus than the other things kind of around it in a similar plane of focus. And you know, they, they definitely pop out. Um, something I'll mention here as well that I haven't mentioned earlier, um, this area where there's a lot of vignetting also turns out to be a lot cooler of a tone. So if you do want to kind of try to get rid of most of that on this lens and on this combo, you probably will want to use uh, like a gradient filter and add a little bit of warmth back into those areas, even though you know, you're not going to be getting any detail there. Um, but at least it would color match this whole area a little bit more in the whole image. So same thing here. Again, this is, you know, like a 40 millimeter or 35 millimeter equivalent. So you're also getting that kind of wide depthy kind of look. But you can see down here on the edges, actually you can, you can also see now that we've kind of moved in this direction that it's like her hand is almost in focus in the front and then her face is totally out of focus. But you can see the, the depth right here versus the depth up here you know, is, is significantly different. So, so here is a photo of my brother who obviously isn't looking super, uh, posy in this because I was just more testing and, uh, you know, I, I, when I'm using a different lens or a different combination, I spend a lot of time just like taking photos of my family and whatnot to kind of get a good idea of what's going on. It's a picture of my brother, but I feel like it gives you that really kind of vintage look of a medium format camera with that like very shallow depth of field, that very 3D pop. Um, and also this is with a kind of beta preset that I've been working on. So um, yeah, let me know in the comments below what you think of this look and the look of these next few because these next uh, four or five images or so are, are all with that new preset that I've been working on. 
So here's a photo of uh, a couple of my nieces and one of my cousin's kids. Uh, and the reason that I showed this one in particular is because you're getting that really exaggerated smearing bokeh here, um, but you're getting really nice bokeh up here and then that smear again. Um, but in this kind of context, I feel like it looks really good and you get that very uh, almost like Petzval style or Petzval lens kind of look. Um, and at this distance and at this depth, it's kind of where the whole thing kind of comes together and I think looks really, really good. And then these next few are just kind of like really good examples of how incredibly shallow this lens can be with this combination and how clean, honestly, you can make everything look too. Um, so obviously these are just me feeding my kids some Cheerios and snapping a couple photos of him. Um, and honestly, I mean, there's part of this where if you, I've taken a lot of photos of my kids in that same area with, uh, you know, my old 645 cameras and between the tonality and the depth of field, this is definitely more shallow than the depth of field I was getting out of my Mamiya 645 with my 1.9 lens, but it feels very, very reminiscent of that. Um, and so it's something I really like about this combo in these, both in the tones of this preset, especially this one, my goodness, uh, it really reminds me of some almost expired Kodak Gold that I have used in the past. Um, and I know that specifically because I have taken photos of my kids in this high chair at my parents' house with the same backdrops and everything and similar lighting. So um, anyway, just an unbelievable kind of look at times. Um, and just cool that you can just bust this out on a digital camera and use this all the time. Like I took these photos just a couple hours ago and to get this look otherwise, I would have definitely had to shoot film and you know send it out to Indie Film Lab, which I still love to do, but that takes a while and costs uh, money every time I do it. All right, so what do you think? I mean, it's definitely not a perfect lens or perfect setup in any way, obviously. But I think as a very, very unique and sort of artistic tool, and for the price point, you're getting something that is very, very unique looking. It can be adapted to multiple cameras. Um, and honestly, just kind of like it was a fun, fun, fun lens to use, especially if you are using it in kind of that square crop mode, then you're not running into all of those outside issues with smearing and uh, vignetting and distortion. So if you were going to use this, especially on like this Hasselblad or something that you're giving more of that square or even six, seven crop, then you're gonna be pretty much good to go. So thanks so much for watching. Let me know if you have, again, any questions about these. I will definitely be doing individual review on each of them. I've also done a review on the Hasselblad X1D2, as well as a review of the other model in this series, the Fujifilm GFX 50R. So lots of content within that on this channel. And I've also done a series of lens tests that go from APS-C all the way up to the you know medium format I did with the GFX 50R. So if you're interested in any of the lenses that I have, I think I did, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something lenses uh, and compared them on each of the size sensors. So you can see that even a kind of random lens like this, Seven Artisans 28 millimeter F1.4, uh, is actually a pretty viable option for this system. So you can see which lenses kind of work and which don't, um, and you can get kind of that good perspective for all of it. So thanks again. Subscribe if you aren't already, and if you're interested in seeing some of this future content or some of the other stuff that I've already made, and I will see you on the next one.